Stage Colorado podcast. I'm Alex Miller here uh, once again with arts reporter Tony Tresca. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Good morning, Alex. It is going very well. All right. Wow, that's it sounds bright and bright and early here on a on a Sunday morning. We're not bright and early. It's ten o'clock. So um, we were recording here on April seventh. So think about that when we're talking about shows uh, this weekend or next weekend or whatever. So as usual, uh, we'll look at uh, some of the latest shows that we've seen or, or reviewed as well as uh, take a look around at what's coming up all around Colorado. Um, and then later in the, in the podcast, we have an interview with Kate Hamill and you want to uh, tease that one a little bit, Tony? Absolutely. Yeah. So Kate is a New York uh, city based actor and playwright who is known for her kind of uh, feminist forward uh, literary adaptations. Uh, she's going to be, she's been in Denver working uh, with the Denver Center on their upcoming production of Emma, which she wrote. And so we just have a really fun conversation about her career, what inspires her, and what it's been like to come to Denver and work on Emma. Uh huh. Great. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to be a really uh, fun show. Uh, to I'm, check ex- out. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm, I, she's, she's back in town now for previews and I'm excited to uh, be there on opening night and get to meet her in person because she's, she's still here in town working on notes and like re- doing, helping tighten up the play and everything, even though it's already, it's already open. She just, that's how much she loves the play uh-huh. and this work and working that's with great. Meredith McDowna, who is the director. Uh huh. All right. Um, looking at the the mail room, uh, we had one interesting comment this week that that we were talking about a little a little last night when you were over uh, at at our house here. Um, and one of the uh, I, on my, my review of Hold Tight's performance art piece, Tethered Untethered, um, I made the observation that I thought it was you know kind of dragged in places or or went on a little bit too long, and and uh, I suggested it could be cut a little bit. Somebody jumped on and said you know that they took issue with. You know, it's one thing to say that the piece is is got some long or boring parts uh, in it. Uh, it's another to actually suggest to an edit. Um, and so, and I, you know, I was like, well, thanks for the comment, you know, but, but uh, I don't know. Do you think critics have the, <laughs> uh, I don't know, do we, do we dare have the temerity? I do, <laughs> I, I do think critics uh, should feel inclined to critique and actually still have and offer their observations on the piece as well as suggestions. I, I think that is the, that fits well within the role of the critic. I mean, obviously the artists do not have to listen. They don't have to take those critiques. Yeah. Uh, but I think that they're really, they're really valuable in shaping just how in actually understanding how your work impacts an audience and like what could have made it even more impactful. And so, uh, well, I understand the sentiment of maybe not wanting to be like, don't tell the artists what to make. That's, if you want to do that, go make your own thing. I was like, well, I don't know if I totally agree with that because I think that is kind of the role of the critic to kind of support, offer those observations and help artists. Maybe they can take them in the future or not. Absolutely. I have to say also that one of my most frequent criticisms of almost everything I see, not not almost everything, but a lot of shows that I see is that, man, I would have cut 10 or 15 or 20 minutes out of that thing. And then speaking as a former director and someone who's written plays and stuff, I feel like I have some authority to, to, you know, if somebody had said, Hey, what do you think of this play? I would, I would almost, you know, I would certainly feel comfortable saying, Hey, I would cut some, some stuff out of that. And I'll never forget when I was doing a few good men, uh, which is Aaron Sorkin's like sort of big, big entree into, into the theater world that led on, went on to his, uh, his you know huge career as a tv and screenwriter but man mm-hmm. that thing is long and it was like every time i was i was in it i was like god why why can't we just cut this you know this part it's so long i was like <laughs> so even even some of our great like greatest playwrights are guilty of it so hey i um, mean people trim yeah. shakespeare all the time that's if right you can cut shakespeare and you can offer your observations in that regard i think you can you can say that a dance piece could be a little shorter tighten it up yep so anyway, but anyway, it, that was a it was a it was a fun show. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, another show that's starting this week on Wednesday is MJ at the Denver Center. This is a touring Broadway production about Michael Jackson, and I had really mixed. I, I kind of I didn't I took that out of our calendar, and I'm not going to cover it. And I because I think uh, Michael Jackson's a bad person or was a bad person, uh, and and did some even if he didn't actually get you know convicted of any kind of child you know, abuse or whatever, it seemed like a, a lot of, a lot of accusations leveled that, uh, uh, I don't know, but, 
but you know, it also made me think about like, like recently uh, my son Andy had never seen a Woody Allen film. And so we mm. watched Lo- love and death, which is one of my favorites of his. And you know, same thing. It's like, well, should I never watch a Woody Allen film? Uh, because of, you know, whatever things he's done. And of course, you know, art and literature and all that is littered with people who, you know, were less than perfect humans who created great art. So I don't know. What do you think about that, Tony? Yeah, I mean, I, so I am talking with the, with the creative team of MJ next week. And this is one of the questions I have for them is just like, how do you grapple with his legacy? Because I know that the, as performers, because I know that that's not something that's really intrinsic uh, in the text of the musical itself, MJ, because it is produced uh, by the family estate. So I, I, it is a really interesting, interesting line. I feel really mixed about it as well, because I don't really know Michael Jackson all that much. I guess I'm revealing my age here. I, I know Thriller, I know Beat It, a couple of his hits, but he was not somebody who I grew up on. He did not have a real impact on me. I kind of really just learned who he was when he died and then when that finding neverland documentary came out about him so i i think it's more it's definitely more complicated sounds like for you who kind of have this background with him and so maybe feel that sense of betrayal i'm just more curious how they do it and why yeah well just to be clear i was never a fan of michael jackson uh but i did grow up in the 70s and 80s and 90s and and and, and uh, certainly he was he was everywhere and had a, had a couple of interesting songs but uh yeah just kind of a weird dude so anyway well i guess uh you know if, if, you, if you can hold your nose and and go see it i'm sure it'll be a good show if you don't think too much about uh michael jackson himself so um, another theater that we were talking about recently is Curious Theater Company in Denver, who recently came out very publicly and said, kind of said, we're broke. We need help. Uh, and they're yeah. really, you know, uh, and I think you know a little bit more about this story. Do you want to kind of outline it? Absolutely. So, yeah, they, they're they really honest. Uh, Janine Bragg, who is the managing director over there, was ex- she explicitly said, we're at a crossroads. Uh, and in order to cover their $250,000 deficit by July, uh, they are fu- they've announced a fund the future uh, campaign that is kind of centered on making up that deficit because they just have they are an organization that has historically brought in around one point three million dollars a year. However, they are nowhere uh, they're nowhere near that total uh, as of twenty twenty three. So they they're qu- they're much closer to eight hundred thousand dollars eight hundred thousand nine hundred thousand dollars a year, which is a significant decrease. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they've got mounting mounting costs for shows the building also has is uh it's a historic building it used to be a church it was built in the 1800s and there's not there's a lot of maintenance issues on this uh, it was built in 1895 as and so monthly it costs about nine thousand five hundred dollars just for basic upkeep and then last year they also had the additional expense of they had to replace their roof and their boiler which cost another hundred thousand dollars and if you've been paying attention, the larger trends within the national theater industry, uh, this is a bad time for that, uh, for them to be having all these extra expenses and these rising costs. Uh, and as it just felt like they've been playing catch up uh, and to, they still have not been able to get there. So they decided to go public and announce a three phase plan uh, include that involves recovery, reinvention and resiliency. Uh-huh. Yeah, as you know, we've talked in the past about sort of the blessing and curse of having your own space. Uh, And of course, the curious is a wonderful, I love going there. It's just like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's the opposite of going into like, you know, some, I don't know, brand new, I mean, brand new theater is gonna be great, too. But it's it's just got all this history around as this old church, and it's got that great balcony up there. And um and 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 curious is such a really important theater company in Colorado, they really do. They touch things that a lot of theater companies wouldn't dare. Too, mm-hmm. and they they, uh, they push the conversation in, in interesting directions so hopefully uh, that will help uh, you know the people will stand up and, and help them out absolutely yeah because there's just there aren't a lot of companies who are willing to produce the type of shows that curious is doing which is a blessing but as they uh, as both jada uh, susanna dickens and janine both mentioned that's also a little bit of a why they're kind of in this situation as well is because their programming has to all be mission driven and they're dedicated to producing these really kind of difficult shows that really make you think. But a lot of audiences right now are kind of they're flocking to more lighter fare, uh, they've noted. And so they've been having a hard time getting people back. And so they're kind of just at that point where they either are going to have to cut people 
sell the building or sacrifice the number of productions that they're doing. And so even with this fundraising effort that they're doing, so it's a it's definitely a difficult time for for curious theaters. So if you have some additional funds that you can throw their way, they they can really use that right now. All right. Well, um, speaking of you know show selections, uh, we wanted to talk for kind of our main thread here about some of the new seasons that have been announced from the Denver Center, uh, uh, Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Bob Blue up in Fort Collins, and then down south at the um, Fine Arts Center at Colorado College, uh, and so. It's kind of what to talk about. So DCPA, uh, you know, just recently announced their season and they're, you know, they, they often do a Shakespeare. So they're doing the big, the big one uh, in September, mm-hmm. October, Hamlet. I think Chris Coleman's directing. That's um, right. You know, not much more to say about that other than uh, Hamlet is a great play <laughs> and, and uh, Denver Center usually does a great job uh, producing uh, Shakespeare. So looking forward to that. It's, um, is this one also, did you note from the, is this one in the round as well, like they did with Much Ado last season, or is this in a different space? Uh, I, you know, I didn't notice, which I would guess it's probably in the, the Kilstrom, the, the round theater, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, they're also doing uh, I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter in October, November. This is about a Chicago high schooler dealing with the death of a sister uh, and um uh, that kind of family dynamics that goes on after that. And then uh, also in that time frame, October, never doing a show, a one-hander called a vase uh, about, uh, and the, and the, the guy that uh, wrote it and, and is producing it or doing it is Michael Sheehan, who's uh, talks about his Ar- Iranian mom. And so it's supposedly quite hilarious. So that sounds pretty interesting. And I can't think of the last time Denver center did a one-hander. It's been, it's been a while. It's been a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And then, of course, two world premieres that we've talked about several times, uh, The Reservoir by Colorado playwright Jake Brash. That'll be in January and March. And The Suffragette's Murder by Sandy Rustin in February and March. And these were both plays that came out of the Colorado New Play Summit uh, that, you know, we've both heard readings of. They're both great plays. Mm -hmm. Really looking forward to to both of those. Um, And then the next one is an old favorite, but I have to say it might just be my favorite musical, Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, in April and in May, I think that's on the, near the top of your list too, isn't it, Tony? It is the you can't you can't see it since it's the podcast form, but I've got my little <laughs> shop of horrors poster <laughs> hanging proudly behind me as we record this. Yeah, I love this musical. I love it so much. I love the movie too uh, with R- Rick Moranis, Rick and... Moranis, and Steve Martin. Odds, oh, yeah, that, it it's a really and... it's really well made. Yes. Yeah. So definitely looking forward to it. I'm glad. I'm glad it's, I mean, you know, even though uh, these shows, a show like that has been around a while, it's always good to see one of them, you know, one of them land at like say the Arvada center or Denver center where they give it a star treatment with a huge production and all the bells and whistles. It's fun. It's fun to watch. And of course that show does have a certain amount of special effects that are, that are a little challenging to do. So yeah, I was about uh, to say, I love, I love little shop, but it's always, it's hard. It's really a hard production for like community theaters to really do with the full special effects of it all. So I am excited to see what the how much money the Denver Center throws at it. If, if Audrey Two does not eat the theater at the end of the show, <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be pissed. <laughs> yeah, you know, I wonder like if, in this in this day and age with our technology, if if uh, you know someone in a in a you know in a puppet suit is going to be replaced by something different. I don't know, a hologram or I don't know. I'm sure there's probably cool ways to do it uh, now from, I, I remember we did it at the backstage theater back in the nineties. And uh, uh, my a friend of mine who was playing the play in the plant was like, he would be in there with like just almost nothing on. Cause he was just sweating his ass off in there. Uh, ah. And uh, you know, it was, it was, t- it was a tough thing. You know, of course he didn't, he didn't get any, you know, FaceTime either. So it's a thankless uh, part in some ways. Cause he didn't even get to do the voice. Um, anyway, uh, another one coming up is Hot Wing King in April and May. So this is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, play about a cooking contest with a lot of sounds like family arguments and stuff. And maybe shades of the bear in there uh, somewhere. But and, and also, yeah. also they, they talk about the Hot Wang King uh, in the description. And I'm so I'm not entirely sure. And it wasn't a typo or anything. It was like apparently there's some some maybe some phallic references that go along with. I don't know. So, so that one sounds uh, pretty fun. And then, of course, uh, uh, Christmas Carol will be back for its 30th year on stage at the Denver Center, which is always fun to check out. And the new play summit will be in early March. And that's uh, the Denver Center's Denver Center uh, Theater Company uh, season, different, of course, from the Denver Center attractions or whatever they call it these days, which is the Broadway touring shows. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, Betsy, uh, recently announced there. New season. Uh, they're starting off with the ballot of Paula. P- 
Paula. How do you pronounce P A O L A? Paula. I think it's Paula. Yeah, Paula. Paula Aguilar by Bernardo Cubria. This is in October, November at the Dairy. It's a Mexican uh, playwright. It's a comedy take uh, on identity politics and a one party's pursuit of Hispanic voters. Um, Little Women uh, adaptation uh, by uh, Jess Rubley. It will be doing that. Uh, and that's going to be like their kind of their holiday show at the Dairy uh, through December. Um, I feel like that's a good holiday show. It's got it's kind of got Christmassy elements in the background drop of the story itself, but then also it's it's this classical piece of literature that people can take their families to over the holidays. I also really just like Little Women. It's a really it's a really good book. So yeah, yeah. So I I had a feature about their season on uh, that uh, we published a, I don't know two weeks ago or so, and and Jess mm-hmm. was saying was talking about you know. Um, specifically like a lot of men who like think that's not a story for them and she was kind of addressing that and she's like don't be put up by the title and uh you know it's not just about women it's got you know it's a real coming of age story uh that's got plenty of plenty of application to uh other other than people other than girls i guess uh hope and gravity this one i'm really excited about so this is a, a play by michael hollinger that they they did as a reading last year. I don't know if you saw this, Tony. It was at the Savoy. I, I did not see this one. And oh my God, it's a funny script. It was so funny. It's about five interconnected lives uh, after this elevator accident. Um, and oh. I was just, I mean, and it had a, you know how sometimes a reading can be like, I don't need to see the full production. That was such a good reading with such great actors uh, and direction. Uh, yeah, so, so that one's uh, coming back in a full production. And and then uh, the white chip is closing out their season uh, April and May at the dairy. This is uh, an autobiographical <laughs> comedy about a man coming into grips with his alcoholism as he hits rock bottom. Um, anything else there, Tony? It's a pretty interesting season from uh, Denver Center and Betsy so far. It's a kind of a nice bl- a lot of newer newer stuff in there, and only like yeah. one or one or two. Uh, of the like, classical fairs that you might expect. And even uh, Betsy's Little Women adaptation is a new adaptation. So that, yeah. that's pretty cool. They see, I, I, we hear a lot about a uh, new theater not being programming, not marketable and companies abandoning that. So it's, it's nice to see in these season announcements that that's not quite true here in Colorado yet. Yeah. I just want to check something real quick. I feel like I'm f- missing one of their shows. I thought oh, you, yeah. yeah oh, Enemy of the People. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. So this, uh, they're actually kicking off the season with uh, Ibsen's play Enemy of the People. Uh, and Mark Reagan, uh, the executive director there, is adapting it. And as speaking of cutting things, I mean, he's cutting a lot out of <laughs> this play because it was super long. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is a really interesting play that has some definite, definitely uh, applications, especially coming, coming in around the election uh, season in September, October. Uh, that'll be at the, the Dairy Center in Boulder. Is there's a? I really want to see Jeremy Strong, who is a succession yeah. actor. He's currently leading a production of Enemy of the People in New York right now, and it just looks so sharp. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Someone wants to fly us out. Uh, you can <laughs> feel free. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, you know, there's uh there's some theaters that do uh, theater trips, and I know that Theater Silco, formerly Lake Dillon Theater Company, does a every year they take a they do a trip to New York. Uh, and I think they've done London a time or two as well. And it's like kind of a cool thing if you've got the the money and the time uh, to sign up for one of those where you just go and you see a bunch of shows, uh, you know, in New York or for uh, London. Uh, anyway, so uh, over uh, down at the Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. So uh, they're doing Dial M for Murder. So this is a classic, a uh, new version of the classic murder mystery uh, that inspired the, the Hitchcock movie. And that'll be in September and October. Um, the city dog and the prairie dog, and there's also a Spanish translation of that, which I won't try, which I won't butcher here. Uh, lots of singing, dancing, and audience participation. Uh, it's a bilingual story about exploring the world, learning new things, and maybe just maybe coming home again. So that'll be in November, and then they're doing the Little Mermaid, which we all know pretty well, and that'll be kind of like their holiday show, which makes sense. Um, well, in November, December. And then they're doing a world premiere of a show called In Her Bones. Uh, and it says, when an unexpected blizzard forces a first-year college student to wait out the storm at a rural highway gas station in southern Colorado, she's forced to confront a past that is both fleeing and seeking out. Uh, so that sounds interesting. 
And then, that actually uh, sounds really compelling. I'm, I want to yeah, see that. <laughs> yeah, I want to learn more about that one. Uh, they're doing in February and March. They're doing Naked Mole Rat Gets Dressed: The Rock Experience. Uh, it's a rock and roll parable with a message for uh, today's audience. And I think this might be a kids show. It says it's based on the hit children's books, book by Mo Willems. Uh, and then they're doing a uh, war horse uh, com- musical comedy sister act uh, in May. Uh, always fun to see uh, that uh, uh, lots of sh- theaters usually have success with. And then uh, going up I-25 a couple of hours to Fort Collins, Bob Blue, uh, is their main stage show. The first one, I'm going to probably make this trip to see the school for lies by David Ives. Who's one of my favorite playwrights. And if you've, if you've never read or seen any David Ives, he's a really inventive playwright. He started out kind of writing these really short, uh, and, and a lot of sometimes theaters uh, will do like compilations where they do like five or six uh, of his short plays together in one night. And they're super clever. Uh, so this is uh, called, it says it's a wild farce of furious tempo and stunning verbal display, sexy, saucy, and off color. And it's written in rhyming couplets. And David Ives is probably like one of the few players who pull off something in rhyming couplets, uh, but it's based on uh, the misanthrope by Moliere. So looking forward to seeing that. And then they're doing Airness, which is this fun uh, you know, musical about air guitar competitions in uh, mm-hmm. you know, late November into December. So I guess that's kind of their holiday show. That one's uh, been real popular around Colorado I, at, over the past couple of years. I've seen I've seen that show I think twice myself, and then I know it's been played it played at several other theaters as well. It's a good it's a fun script. I just didn't. Yeah, I that is not. If you were to have asked me when I saw it a few years ago, if I thought that would be the script, a bunch of theaters would really grab onto. I wouldn't. I don't think I would have called it. But yeah, air guitar is just. The, the, it's just the concept of it is so funny. And I have to say, I have a little bit of an air guitar story myself. I when I was in high school, I was on the student council up in you know at Summit High. And I read about this air guitar contest that they had, and this was before anybody kind of really knew what it was. And we were trying to think of ideas for like fundraisers or you know fun things to do. And I suggested that we do an air band concert. And so that was in 1982. And the air band concert is, to, to my knowledge, is still an annual tradition at Summit High School. <laughs> so, wow! Uh, and uh, I was I was a presenter with Wendy Moore. She was on stage. Uh, with oh me as, as the co-host and we were and uh yeah it was it was it was a lot of fun but anyway air guitar is a lot of fun so uh created a local bit of lore i know for, for your community know. about I that's know. awesome uh next up at babalu the trip to bountiful by horton foot and warren Sherrill is is coming up from uh, uh miners alley to do that one in february and march uh it's a story of an elderly woman who longs to escape her cramped houston apartment uh, where she lives with her protective son and her authoritarian daughter-in-law. <laughs> so that sounds uh, <laughs> sounds pretty interesting. And then uh, two more. They're doing uh, another Medea by Aaron Mark, uh, and this will be in May and June. Uh, story of the incarcerated Marcus Sharp, a New York actor who recounts in gruesome detail how his obsessions with a wealthy doctor and the myth of Medea lead to horrific, unspeakable events. Have you ever seen or read this one? I've, I, I know it, I've heard it, of it before. I've never seen it. No, yeah. I've, I've never, I've never seen it before. Okay, so maybe we should go down and go up to Fort Collins for that one too. And then finally, yeah. uh, they're closing out the seal. See, yeah, they're closing out this season with "My Brilliant Divorce" by Geraldine Aaron, uh, and this will be uh, May and June. It's a one-woman show that's you know, apparently very funny about a woman who's uh, looking for the for the next thing after she's been divorced. So anyway, well, of course, there will be other uh, season announcements coming up. We always post them uh, on our our uh, website, and uh, I don't. I usually just put press release at top. I don't. I don't edit them. I just kind of let them say what they want to say. Uh, and uh, and a lot of I've noticed a lot of people find those those uh, those stories throughout the year when they're looking to see uh, you know what theaters are doing. Uh, so they're uh, so I really like having them on the site. So. Um, Anyway, uh, well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, a look around at all the shows uh, coming up around Colorado, as well as uh, Tony, your interview with Kate Hamill. So stick around. We'll be right back. On Stage Colorado is sponsored by the Town Hall Arts Center in Littleton, presenting Raisin from March 22nd through April 14th, a musical retelling of Lorraine Hansberry's classic A Raisin in the Sun. The soulful and inspiring musical is about a proud black family's quest for a better life in 1951 Chicago. It's a timeless story of family conflict, forgiveness, and the pursuit of the American dream. Tickets at townhallartscenter.org. 
On Stage Colorado is also sponsored by the Boulder Ensemble Theatre Company, Betsy, with several upcoming shows, including the kids' improv show Mad Librarians, with shows in Denver and Boulder, as well as the Kingpenny Golden Radio Hour, also with shows in Denver and Boulder. Tickets at Betsy.org. Support also comes from the Aurora Fox Arts Center, whose next show is Gem of the Ocean, opening March 23rd and running through April 14th. The play is the first in the Aurora Fox's commitment to produce August Wilson's 10 play, The American Century Cycle. Boasting multiple Tony Awards and Pulitzer Prizes for drama, the cycle follows the lives of black Americans throughout each decade of the 20th century. Tickets at auroraFoxArtsCenter.org. All right, welcome back to the On Stage Colorado podcast. It's time for our weekly whip around the state to see what's on stage now and coming up. So uh, shows that we've recently v- reviewed that are on the site uh, and that are, that we're going to be at soon uh, include... So I want to talk about these two kind of together. So uh, The Bluebird was Theater Autobus's show that just closed um, at, uh, you know, kind of a performance art piece or a movement uh, piece. Uh, and, yeah. and then we saw, we both saw Tethered, Untethered at uh, Studio Loft by the company Hold Tight, which is a, definitely a performance art company. And so both of these shows um, are you know, they require a different kind of mindset to to go into. You know, you're not necessarily going to see, uh, it's not so scripted as it is, uh, you know, based on movement and feeling. And, you know, in the case of, uh, actually, both of them, there's a lot of visual and audio elements uh, to it. Mm-hmm. Lubert had a lot of really great original music, as did Tethered, Untethered. Uh, and in that case, the musician was on stage. Uh, the guy who composed it was also on stage. So, uh, but you know, mm-hmm. we, we were talking about the fact that we don't see a ton of performance art uh, here in, in the Denver area or around Colorado. So, what what do you think of? Uh, I don't know. Do you think the average person can go in and enjoy one of these shows? I I took my wife to both of these, and she was kind of kind of a little kind of on the fence on on both of them. Mm, interesting. I I think yeah. I think a reason that they we don't maybe see them is that. Uh, they're they're kind of hard to to market. Yeah, I, I think you you really do. You're marketing essentially kind of a an experience, like a a weird trippy experience. Essentially, you may not get you may not get everything, and it really is less about story than about what you're feeling through that. Which, you know, that's not what everybody goes to theater or entertainment for is to is is that. And so I think that that can make it. A difficult pitch to finance as well as just to get people to show up for. Now, do I think a regular people can enjoy it? It depends on the frame they go in with. I, I, I really thought I was really, really struck by uh, the Bluebird. I was, I had a little bit more of a hard time with hold tights, uh, the tethered, untethered, um, just because it was a, a little bit more cerebral almost and like the storytelling it was a mixture of dance and uh like slam poetry style and then you're also immersive and you're acting and so some of the elements worked for me in that show and some didn't which but i think ultimately i walked away enjoying having gone even if i didn't fully understand it does that make sense yeah yeah, and, and Jen, my wife kind of had the same reaction to that when she was like she's like i'm not sure i was entertained but I was kind of interested or intrigued <laughs> by what was going on. Uh, so, yeah. so, you know, a little bit, a little bit difficult to see some of these and, you know, and if you're like living in New York or, you know, Chicago or places like that, you know, this kind of stuff goes on all the time and people are probably more used to, to seeing it, but uh, I think it's cool. And, and, uh, and I'm sure, you know, the um, uh, Artibus will be, you know, they're, they're a resident company at, uh, at the Savoy. So they will be back with, with more things like that. And, you know, this one was a one-hander, um, you know, with uh, with uh, Booba that he did himself. But usually he's got more people on stage, and uh, so they'll have some. And then the this tethered untethered uh, show from Hold Tight is kind of the first of three. So the the other two will be back, and the, uh, the other two will come up in the fall, and then they're going to do all three together in 2025. So. So Eric uh, reviewed Gem of the Ocean, loved it a lot. It's getting a lot of, uh, I see just a lot of buzz about it. Uh, it's running through April 14th at the Aurora Fox. It's a, an August Wilson play, and it's the the first of, of uh, you know, a number of plays that they, they want to do over the next decade or so of, of his mm-hmm. uh, his American uh, cycle. So uh, that one's uh, still got another week uh, or so to check that out if you can get to it. Uh, also, 
uh, Raisin at the Town Hall Arts Center, Eric also reviewed. That's also running through April 14th, also getting lots of a uh, lot of buzz. Um, that's a, you know it's kind of an alternative telling of a Raisin in the Sun. Uh, so that uh, is definitely another one to check out. Guadalupe in the guest room. Uh, uh, Eric also reviewed that one. He's been out and about, and that's running through uh, April 20th. Uh, that's a that's a kind of a neat little uh, I think four person play that Firehouse is doing at the John Hand Theater in Denver, and then this one's a little bit uh, interesting. Lone Tree Arts Center, which doesn't do a ton of theater, uh, is mm-hmm. doing a production of The Mousetrap, uh, April 11th through 21st. So Eric will be at that one. Sam Gregory is directing this. It's a pretty good looking cast. So you know, classic play that that is always. If you haven't seen The Mousetrap, definitely go check this out. My dog is is. Showing her approval of the mousetrap, I think, or, or her, her <laughs> Macy <concern>. approves. <laughs> oh, or is worried. Yeah, I guess. Maybe yeah, she wants to know like, who did it. Yeah, not just the tell mousetrap. me the murderer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that's cool. I'm not sure how that came about, uh, but uh, I, I know. So, Lone Tree, I know they they made the decision in 2019 to stop producing theater, but and then, which I guess honestly kind of worked in their benefit when the pandemic hit. And everybody had to cancel theater anyway for a, for a time being. But then now they've come back. Like last season, they did uh, Dream Girls, yeah. Dream Girls, which was their kind of kickoff. And so now they're doing the Mouse Trap, which so it kind of seems like their niche, their niche that they're filling is like these really these classic pieces t- t- tried and true uh, over there. Yeah, and yeah, it really is. It's a great play, uh, and that's such a nice theater. It's it's nice to see that they're they're using it for some local productions. I mean, they have a lot of stuff going through there, but it's it's all kind of touring stuff oh, yeah. of all different. Stripes. Oh yeah, that's not to say Lone Tree is not like actively bringing yeah. stuff in. It's just <laughs> not. They're not. They're not produced now. I guess they're kind of getting back into the independent producing game. But it really does seem to be like once or twice a year, rather than like a full season yeah. that they're doing in house at the moment. Yeah. Um, I, I will say, uh, you know, if, if you're if you're on the south side of Denver and you're looking for some kind of interesting programming, both Lone Tree uh, Art Center and the Pace Center in Parker have a lot of interesting stuff coming through. And it's everything from like, you know, a, you know, a dance troupe or a, a magician. You know, of course, they've got some music, some concerts, different like folk and blues and, and stuff like that. Uh, so if you're if you're looking for some some uh, cool entertainment options down down in this neck of the woods, uh, check them out. Um, Emma, which we talked about at the Denver Center, uh, is up now going through May 5th. And uh, our reviewer, Susan Harper, will be at that one, I think, in a couple of days. And then at the Windsor Community Playhouse, they're doing California Suite, which is an old Neil Simon uh, stalwart uh, that uh, it runs through April 21st. Eric will be at that one. And then down in Colorado Springs at the Springs Ensemble Theater Company, they're doing Proof. Uh, April yeah. 11th through 26th, and uh, Judith uh, Sears, our reviewer there, will be at that one. Um, so those are the ones that I know that uh, we either reviewed or we're going to be at. Uh, a couple of a uh, few others coming up. Uh, so uh, Betsy, the uh, Boulder Ensemble Theater Company, is uh, has their uh, King Penny show coming up again. So it's kind of like a I don't know every once a month or two. Uh, it's been at different places. So on uh, this Wednesday, April 10th, it'll be at Buntport. Uh, kind of a old timey radio show kind of thing. That's a, a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was going to mention a couple of things that have kind of given up for so long. You may have forgotten that they're still here, but uh, space explorers, the infinite is uh Denver center off center. Uh, I don't know if you call it a production or an installation. Uh, it's at the Staley marketplace. Yeah. Uh, they're, I guess they're the exhibitor for it because they just, they brought in Felix studios who yeah. they're the creators of it. Yeah. So that, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's really cool. It's a, it's a really kind of a high tech, uh, virtual reality kind of, uh, experience about the pe- being on the international space station. Uh, so it's cool to, to check out us through May 5th. Um, and then, uh, our friends at Improvised Shakespeare, uh, at the Garner Galleria theater there at the Denver center are still going strong. Uh, their, their show is going through April 28th. Uh, so these are the guys that make up a Shakespeare like show on the spot every night. And it's very, very funny. If you haven't seen that one, uh, down at uh, Funky Little Theater Company in Colorado Springs, they are doing a uh, uh, "The Wind Is Us: The Death That Killed Capote." It's a one-hander with only two performances on April thirteenth. If you want to check that out, uh, and then at the Ellie Calkins Opera House at the Denver Center, the Colorado Ballet is doing Ballet Masterworks, and that'll close out their season uh, from April twelfth through the twenty-first. Uh, and then uh, Catamounts have teamed up with Third Law Dance Theater uh, to do something called Teacups and Tiny Dictators. It melds music, theater, dance, and film. 
to meditate on the rise of dictatorships throughout the world. And that'll be uh, April 13th through the 21st. Do you know anything about that one, Tony? I, I know about Third Law Dance. They're a group in Boulder who performs primarily at the Dairy Center. And I know the Catamounts, but I, I can't say I, I know much about this show. Yeah, yeah. I have to find out a little bit more about it. So I have to go check that one out. Yeah, it's yeah. A great title. Uh, if you want to do a wacky dinner theater experience, uh, Adam's Mystery Playhouse in Denver has a, their new one is called Red Hot Murder, uh, and it runs uh, April 12th through 28th. And, and they've got, it's a little hard to keep up with all the titles they have. They just kind of like mix and match them. And, and uh, there's always something going on there if, if you ever want to check that out. Uh, at the Moon Theater in Berthoud, uh, they're doing a, a, a reading of a, a play by a Berthoud uh, playwright named Rick Padden about a couple sticking together through all kinds of mayhem at the Berthoud Activity Hall on April 13th. Don't hear a lot about theater in Berthoud, so uh, definitely cool that there's, there's a new uh, this playwright up there, and they're going to do a reading. Uh, Fireflies will be at Evergreen Players April 12th through 28th. This is a kind of a story about a late-life romance in a small town uh, that uh, will be at the, uh, I think it's called Center Stage there in, in Evergreen. Mm-hmm. And then uh, also at the Dairy, they're doing a uh, something called out of the blue it's a musical uh from the 12th through the 20 uh 12th through the 14th so short run uh, i guess this weekend and tony what uh, what do you know about this one so this is by uh this uh, eli hans who is he's originally from mexico uh and he produced this sh- a one man sh- mostly one man show about his life story uh and about uh he he got diagnosed with cancer and he had a 10% chance of survival. Uh, and so he kind of tells that story intertwined with his past and making peace as like a gay kid on a quest for love. He plays 25, nearly 25 characters, and he's joined briefly by his real life husband, Joseph Bennett, on stage. The whole thing is a fundraiser for uh, out Boulder County. All of the pro- proceeds from the performance after expenses are going back to that organization, which is a local Boulder organization that supports LGBTQ plus uh, youth and uh, and adults kind of like live their best life in the community. And yeah, just it's a very fun, uh, heartwarming show. I got a chance to actually see a screener link of the musical ahead of time. And so I, I can attest it is very well written. The songs are super sharp. And Eli is just such a warm, vulnerable performer that you just get sucked into his really compelling life story. Okay, cool. Well, that sounds great. I'm glad you, you knew a little bit more about that one. Um, Ballet Ariel is going to be doing their uh, Silver Anniversary Dance Collection on April 13th. So this is like a kind of a compilation of some of some hits like uh, American in Paris, Appalachian Spring. Uh, and so uh, if you like, uh, if you like to hit a little ballet, that's an opportunity there. And then uh, I'm going to be at uh, Meow Wolf uh, this weekend on uh, I guess Saturday to see uh, Don't Tell Comedy, which we've talked about a number of times before, but I, I haven't actually been. And uh, Meow Wolf seems like they're they're hosting them on a somewhat regular basis. So a uh, mm-hmm. chance to see some stand-up comedy in a really interesting place. So uh, anything else, Tony? What else uh, did, What have we not touched on? Yeah, so if you want to see... Um... A musical in de- a project in development. I've got a, a, a reading coming up from Graham and Christina Fuller, who is the they're the creative team behind In the Trenches uh, from a few from just a little while ago. And this is a musical called Miss Manhattan about the life of Audrey Munson, who was once the most famous supermodel in the Gilded Age and the first woman to pose nude for film. Uh, but she has largely been forgotten by history because her mom committed her to a mental institution on her 40th birthday. Oh my god! Kind of a kind of a shitty birthday present, if you ask me. Yeah, thanks, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> so, uh, but if you are interested in hearing more about this story, uh, there the Fullers are going to be doing a reading of this play April 18th through the 20th. It's going to be at Lu- in Louisville at Center Stage Theater uh, there, and so. I really enjoyed their work on In the Trenches, and this sounds like uh, a ver- which was a parenting comedy. And so this one sounds extremely different. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious to see how they musicalize this. Uh, and then just two two other ones real quickly. Uh, up If you want some dinner theater, Candlelight is about to open their production of The Secret Garden, uh, which runs April 18th through June 16th up there. And that's a that's a musical adaptation based off of that classic piece of literature. And then 
finally, Theatre Company of Lafayette is going to be presenting Moliere's The Misanthrope. However, it's a influencer adaptation on this French classic. So they're setting it in the contemporary day in the world of social media posts, DMs, and fragile reputations uh, to kind of draw attention to those themes within the script. And that one's going to be directed by Brett Landis April 19th through May 5th at the Theatre Company of Lafayette's Theatre. Uh, okay. Up there. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, tons of stuff going on. Uh, we'll get to as much of it as we can, but uh, yeah, definitely check out our calendar to see uh, when all these uh, shows are going to be the performance dates and all that. So, uh, all right. Well, hold on uh, for just a sec, and we will have uh, Tony's interview with playwright Kate Hamill of Emma. Well, hey, Kate, how is it going? It's great to be talking with you again. Hi, good morning. Great to talk to you. Yes, well, for for those who don't know, today on our podcast, we are thrilled to welcome Kate Hamill, the award-winning New York-based actor and playwright, renowned for her innovation, innovative and feminist adaptations of classical literature. Uh, we're especially excited to invite her on the podcast today, today to talk about her latest project, the delightfully unconventional adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. Uh, so thank you so much for making some time to talk about your work today. Can you, can you, let's start by talk, talking a little bit about what sparked your interest in theater? What brought you into this world? Oh, what started, started my interest in theater? Um, I was a very uh, high energy, highly emotional child. Uh, and, uh, I was not real sporty. Uh, and, uh, my, I, there was a wonderful woman who ran a sort of like theater program in my very small, um, primary school. Uh, and I, I sort of stumbled into it and fell in love pretty quickly. It seemed like, um, uh, it was just like a natural outlet for me. And then, so it, I was pretty young. I mean, I must have been like, 12 um when i really yeah. fell in love with it and uh then i went to school for acting i went uh, and got my bfa in acting and um yeah it was pretty pretty early on like like many people i i, I felt um theater made me feel a sort of connection and catharsis i i, I don't find in quite that way in any other way so i've I've been I've been on these mean streets for a little while now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so you've done quite a number of Jane Austen adaptations mm -hmm. already. What 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 draws you to to her work and and why Emma? Sure. Um uh so I I've I've written not just Jane Austen adaptations but adaptations of a bunch of things and also new plays as well, but the reason why uh, I started the my first full length play ever was a Jane Austen adaptation. Um, I'm very interested in creating feminist female centered um adaptations that are highly theatrical and irreverent and uh come from a new play lens. Um, because I really believe that um these classics are cultural touchstones for us and um that they are a common language that we teach in our schools that we uh, hold up as common meanings. And if so, if you can break them open and use them to re-examine what a hero or in my case, a heroine's journey is, you actually can open people's minds about a lot of stuff that's going on in the world. Um, so I started out with Jane Austen because she's interested in a lot of the things that I am interested in as a playwright. Um, she was a proto-feminist. She's very interested in hypocrisies and the absurdities of human nature. I'm very interested in how like the dictates of people's consciences and their identities smack up against what society expects of us. And Jane Austen certainly is interested in that. And she's she's also very funny. And I I cannot help I I really love writing comedy as well. And uh, when I first started writing Jane Austen adaptations, the vast majority of all Austen adaptations um, were written by men um, mm. uh, that were getting done in theaters everywhere. And there's nothing wrong with 
Austin adaptations done by men for the record at all. But I was like, well, that seems weird that a young female writer would not be adapted by an, another young female writer. Um, so I decided to do all the Austin adaptations in the order that she did the novels. Uh, so I am on number, uh, excluding the ju Juvenilia, uh, Emma is number five for me, uh, of technically there are six, but I'll, I'll probably end up doing seven. Um, so I'm on number five of seven and I've been writing them since 2013, 2014. So, <laughs> uh, Emma's the latest. You're an actor, you're an actor as well so yes. how does that kind of influence your writing process does it at all or are those kind of two different buckets for you uh i think uh like many hybrid artists um i cannot help but be influenced by the different sides of my personality so i tend to i really love actors i really um uh, and my text is very heavily, some writers are a little bit more design oriented, some are um, more director oriented, and I um, heavily celebrate designers and directors, but mine are very, very actor oriented. So I try to make every part in a play equally interesting to play. So no one has to play a spear carrier. Um my stuff tends to be very ensemble driven. So everyone in the ensemble has to be like about um, uh, equally strong. Um, mm. And I very much uh, tailor it to whoever uh, is in the world premiere, which I'm invariably there the whole process. So I'm very much tailoring that character um, towards the actor's ideas in the world premiere and incorporating their natural energies and um in the plays themselves i like to make it so you can scale it up you can have like a big production with a lot of ideas and a lot of money and budget or you could do it very very well just with like almost no money spent on anything except you have great actors speaking um text and that is very dependent on actors and that's really where i come from i'm an actor myself i'm married to an actor so um that is natural for me that i really start with um actors and text and then everything up is scaled everything else is scaled up or down from there yeah can you talk a little bit about how that kind of relates to the current production over at the Denver Center, which I, I know you were in some rehearsals for, you came, you were in Denver for a bit for. Uh, how does that kind of manifest in Emma? Um, well, we've been really lucky on Emma. As you said, uh, Emma is sort of a, a, a surprisingly long form process for me. I wrote the, um, uh, I first wrote the script in 2019 and we were supposed to go up in 2020 for the world premiere at the Guthrie. Um, and obviously it was March, 2020. So we got about a weekend and, uh, Did you have any problems? Did something happen around that <laughs> nothing time? Nothing went wrong. <laughs> Everything went just as planned. Um, so, but then we ultimately, obviously that production, you know, was put on hold, but then it did go up mm -hmm. in um, spring 20, uh, summer 2022 at the Guthrie with the same um, creative team and cast, including our wonderful director, Meredith McDonough. And um, then it has had a couple of production. And so there was the world premiere at the Guthrie. There's a production of Playmakers, uh, which Meredith also directed and our wonderful choreographer, Emily Michaels Kate was also on. And then, um, and our design team, much of our design team, and now we are it here. So this is a play that is, we have, uh, the creative team um, has had a lot of time to think about and to, as Meredith say, says, make it more better all the time. So mm -hmm. this, at this point, is this very, um, is sort of like a comedy machine. We've brought back some of the original casts that we had. So we've had, we have some people who have done this play many, many times. And so um, that is something that I love to do when it can be done because you bring some someone who has already has a rich 
relationship with the character and they can keep deepening it in this sort of you know famously the moscow art theater which che- who is with who um which is the company that Chekhov worked with they used to spend months and months rehearsing a play uh, or i'm sorry years and years rehearsing a play and then they would run it i mean anytime you can have an actor with a really deep uh connection with the material i think it just deepens and gets more and more fun so and um so yeah, it's all of us have had a really long experience with this text and um Meredith uh has been there since the first workshops of this text. So um sh- sh- uh it's been a very very rich relationship um with developing this sort of I love Lucy style comedy that is also about um, the ambitions of women and what happens when women smack up against a glass ceiling or in um, Emma's case, sort of a crystal ceiling. She's kind of a, a, a bird in a beautiful gilded cage. And so, um, yeah, it's just like, a, and I'm super grateful for the Denver Center for bringing me out to just like keep tweaking the text and i'll come back out for previous and opening too i'm sure things will keep changing but it's a really rich wonderful collaboration with these artists um particularly meredith who's the uh, director of this piece and a dear friend yeah it just seemed like a, a real gift to get that bring that team so much of that team through yeah. those three different original kind of first productions of it and really get to continue that workshop process, which that's that's super unique. Not every not every play process gets to have that much development, particularly yeah. nowadays. Uh so that's it. Can you talk a little bit, you you name drop check off already. Uh, <laughs> who are some of your biggest kind of inspirations uh or influences in kind of your theatrical life? You don't have to say check off just for the record. <laughs> uh you know, I l I feel like that list is changing and growing all the time because there are such wonderful artists working now when i was sort of coming when i was growing up um, my father had books of o'neill plays i was i mean i grew up in the middle of the very rural america there was not a ton of exposure to professional theater although shout out to the hangar theater which is about an hour from where i grew up where i saw some shows but um so i i sort of in some ways I'm like most heavily influenced by O'Neill because those were the first plays I ever read. Um, I mean, I, then as a, uh, as, as a college student and into my twenties, I lived with a brilliant playwright named Janine neighbors, who is now mostly shifted into TV, but the American theater is truly sleeping on Janine neighbors because Janine's a brilliant playwright. <laughs> And because she and I are good, good friends and lived together for many years, I saw firsthand um, a lot of playwriting process and was in some of her earlier stuff. So I would say Janine is a very big influence on me. Um, Then there are so many playwrights that I really admire now, and I'm constantly watching things like Bess Wall, Paula Vogel, Sarah Gancher. Um, uh, James at James, like, uh, you know, like there's, I, they're just, there's some really, really exciting artists working now. Um, and I feel like I'm constantly finding people that I'm really, really struck by and inspired by. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a (laughs) O'Neill, <laughs> Janine Neighbors, <laughs> and a bunch of contemporary artists. Yeah, no, that's that's very cool. So how do these kind of like this contemporary approach and these writers that you grow up kind of influence the adaptation process when it comes to turning in like a classic novel into a play like Emma? Or I'm also, I know Colorado audiences will also be able to see your work at the Arvada Center this oh, yeah. upcoming September with uh, <laughs> Dracula. Uh, a revenge, a feminist revenge fantasy, really. Which it, my my compliments to you on the title, <laughs> Thank the you. <whole> title. <laughs> uh, Thank so, you. can you maybe talk a little bit about how you adapt works like that, given that kind of contemporary uh, flavor that you mentioned? 
Yeah, I come at it from a very new play angle. So I mm-hmm. I uh, think of adapting any work uh, as a collaboration between myself and an author, another author who is sometimes currently dead. Um, uh, but these these works are often quite well known works. So I have to come in. And I want to create something that's surprising and really works on its own as a piece of theater, even if you have no connection to the source material at all. I think doing a sort of pale imitation of the original is a disservice to everyone. It's, you know, Mm. like... um, we theater is supposed to be a responsive art. It is supposed to be something I want to sort of kick down the doors of the church and let all the people in. I want to do something irreverent and theatrical and celebrating specifically theatrical form. So I don't come at it from a dramaturgically rigid place. Um, I come at it from a place of, we want to say why this story, why now? So I'm, um, Quite often, in co- I am in conversation with the original, but I am not trying to duplicate the original. So, um, quite often, I come into it pretty much anytime I'm doing an adaptation, which I do do a lot of adaptations. I am asking myself, like I would with a new play, uh, I am asking myself the question: What question do I want to be asking in this mm. play? Um, so. Uh, Emma, the like a central question for me uh, is, you know, uh, <laughs> basically, uh, what do you do when you have a lot of energy and capability, but you society says you have nowhere productive to put it? Um, and that form lent itself very much to a screwball comedy, which is where people put energy, all their energy in the wrong places. So that's why Emma's a screwball comedy. Um, in, in Dracula, I wanted to ask the question, who really are the predators amongst us? So I used Dracula as a sort of um, meditation on toxic masculinity, and toxic masculinity is a sort of virus that haunts us throughout the millennia. Um, and yeah, I'm also influenced by my own relationship uh, by by not only the cultural relationship with the source material but also my own relationship with the source material so like dracula has been done a million times and often Mm -hmm. i i found there are things i like about the the source text otherwise i wouldn't have done it um but i the actual source text is pretty um messed up if you read the original it's quite xenophobic it's quite misogynistic. Um, it's vaguely anti-Semitic, actually, um, in the way that a lot of these 19th century novels that are like, uh-oh, foreigners are coming to prey on us uh, are. Yeah. Um, so I wanted, and a lot of um, traditional adaptations of Dracula either ignore that or are even like a sort of celebration of, is particularly the misogynistic aspects of it. So. I wanted to do something that was like the opposite of that. So I thought, oh, what if I could just totally t- turn this text on its ear? Um, Emma, for example, uh, you know, there's a big sort of to do about Emma being the least quote unquote likable of Jane Austen's heroines. So I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, I, this is about yeah. someone who is privileged but i don't care if she's likable i care i want the audience to kind of root for her and go oh god no i want her to be a sort of i love lucy or hello dolly character i want to i want to create a woman who you can see is a border collie without any sheep and i don't i wanted to create a comedy where women were just allowed to be super messy and um not particularly sexy or beautiful. I mean, these are beautiful women, but like um, that we have in our cast, but they can just like sort of mess around and have fun. And yeah, I was very lucky to have to pair with this creative team that really wanted to do the same thing. Awesome. So previews for Emma at the Denver Center begin on April 5th. Uh, and opening night is April 12th. So 
Get your tickets now for that production, which runs all the way through May 5th and the yes. Wolf Theater there. So when, when do you come back for back to Colorado for that? I come back for previews and openings. So you will see me, if you come to previews, you will see me crouched over in a corner, little pen light scribbling in a book. <laughs> That's wonderful. So everybody, you can... No Kate by the scribbling. The sound <laughs> <of> the scribbling. <laughs> I, I look like Gollum over in the corner with my little crouched, like hiding behind people because I'm very distracting if I sit in the middle of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And then you'll also, the, your work will also be on stage at, with Dracula September 27th through November 3rd over at the Arvada Center. So for those super planners out there, you can go ahead and mark your calendars now. <laughs> so. My my final question uh, for you, Kate, is: Oh, what are what are some works that are kind of on on your dream board? Uh, where you where you want to go next? What are you excited to explore? Um. Well, I'm working on a. Uh, I have two uh, world premieres coming up in the next season. Um. Uh. That I I can talk about one of them. The other one isn't mm-hmm. announced yet. Um. One of them is a play called The Light in the Dark. It's going up at Chautauqua Theater Company. Um, the, the full title is Life in, The Light in the Dark, The Life and Times of Artemisia Gentileschi, uh, who is a Baroque uh, painter uh, and has quite a fascinating story. So I'm into sort of pre-production for that. Um, I'm working on, I also, it seems like, have a new adaptation coming out this year. So that is T to be announced um right now i'm working on a new play that i can't talk much about except that it is a murder mystery um Mm -hmm. and i'm writing another new play uh what can i say about it it's it's a little (laughs) sorry to be so mysterious but you know um when you're in the middle of writing them it feels uh, it, it, it's always strange to talk about them. It seems so much I'll can say, change at that. So point. much can know, change. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'll say the other one I'm uh, writing is a sort of I can say it's set during a time of revolution. So uh, I have a couple of things in rotation right now, and I have um, and maybe working on a Christmassy musical thing but that that is as much as i can say (laughs) tbd people you'll have have to check out your website for more information yeah well thank you so much kate for making some time to swing by the on stage colorado podcast ahead of your the previews and opening night of emma this april uh break a leg at, at to you and the entire team over there thank you so much thank you All right. Well, that was a great interview. What a what a fascinating playwright with a really cool cool mission to uh, bring that to the stage and uh, really hoping to get out and see that one. Even though uh, I'm not I'm not reviewing that one, but uh, so thanks so much to uh, Kate for making time to be on the podcast and Tony for you to, to catching up with her. So yeah, uh, it was a it was a fun conversation. It just made me even more uh, even more eager to see this kind of musicalized take on Emma. All right, Sounds so good. we'll be back in uh, a week or so with uh, uh, another interview. Uh, with uh, I, I know I'm going to be talking to uh, Cipriana Ortega, whose new play Cheyenne will be at the People's Building, uh, starting uh, opening on uh, April 26th. Uh, and we'll, you know, maybe we'll have uh, somebody else in between there. But uh, and then we'll be back with you know our usual lineup of all the stuff that's going on around Colorado. So uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your stuff, uh, and give us a review, a couple of stars on there. Uh, and let other people know about us, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of podcasts out there, but uh, there's, there's only one that's dedicated uh, to exclusively to theater in Colorado that's, that's on any kind of regular basis. So uh, be sure to also check out all the reviews, news, and, and other podcast episodes, and our full statewide theater calendar, which is amazing, on the website at onstagecolorado.com. All right, I'm Alex Miller. I'm Tony Tresca. And we'll see you at the show. Yep, we'll be there.